Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Boston University's online Earth Day, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day worldwide. My name is Lisa Tornator. I'm the director of BU Sustainability, and I'll be today's event host. Today, we'll hear from a variety of speakers, including students, staff, and faculty from Boston University. And we'll cover topics ranging from the connections and relationship between the novel coronavirus and climate change to how we take care of ourselves, others, and the planet. We'd like to thank our panelists for being an integral part of our event. As many of you know, we would normally be welcoming you to an outdoor festival in the George Sherman Union Plaza. So thank you for pivoting to this online activity. Thank you as well to the Wellbeing Project, our partner for co-hosting today's event. A couple of logistical items. We're happy to feature live captioning to increase the accessibility of this event. You may click on the closed caption or CC button on your Zoom toolbar and then click show subtitles. Our program today will include two sessions separated by a 10 minute break. You may also type your questions into the Q&A within the Zoom webinar platform. Next, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Dennis Carlberg. Dennis was BU's first sustainability director and now holds the position of associate vice president, as well as adjunct assistant professorship in the Department of Earth and Environment. Dennis is a practicing architect with over 25 years experience. Dennis, will you please kick, a, kick off our first session? Give us all an overview of BU's sustainability goals and progress. Thank you, Lisa. I would love to do that. So let me share my screen. Is everybody able to see my screen? Okay. So thank you, Lisa. Uh, before I uh, talk about the university's sustainability annual report, I want to reflect briefly on this moment in time. We're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, while at the same time, we're all coping with the impacts of coronavirus. Beyond the statistics, real people are profoundly being affected. The resilience of our society government, and the economy is being tested. I want to take a moment to acknowledge those who are affected and thank those who are on the front lines. With that, let me give you some good news with an update on Boston University's progress toward the goals set forth in the university's strategic plan and approved by the Board of Trustees two and a half years ago. No. Here is a quick snapshot of the progress we are making in campus sustainability. The metrics I will share use a baseline of 2006 from which we measure our progress. Since 2006, the campus has grown in its facilities by, 20, by 12%. We set a goal uh, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2020. We achieved that goal in 2019. We have reduced our energy use intensity by 14%. Think of energy use intensity like you do miles per gallon only for buildings. So our campus overall has gotten 14% more efficient since 2006. We have reduced our waste by 8%. 
you think about reduce, reuse, recycle, reducing waste first is our first goal. And that is the most important piece. But diverting is important as well. In 2006, we had a 3% recycling rate. In 2019, we've increased that to 42%, but we have a long way to go. The details of these metrics and others can be found uh, in the just released sustainability annual report, which is available on the BU sustainability website. The climate action plan set out to prepare our campuses for the impacts from climate change, which can no longer be avoided. We established an elevation of resilience for flooding above which all critical equipment and research should be located. This map illustrates a 100 year storm today. The same storm in 2070 looks more like this, according to the science and the um, consensus uh, for sea level rise in Boston. The first floor of the Center for Computing and Data Sciences, which is under, now in con under construction, is located one or will be located 1.25 feet above our elevation of resilience. The Killeshawn Center for Integrated Life Sciences and Engineering has no basement. All the mechanical and electrical equipment is located on the second and third floors out of harm's way. The, um, the Climate Action Plan recommended that we uh, per perform a more in-depth vulnerability assessment for the medical campus because it is more exposed to sea level rise impacts. That assessment is well underway. I'm going to um, turn now to how we get to uh, achieve uh, a reduction in our direct emissions uh, to net zero by 2040. This photograph was taken just a month ago at the BU wind, site, wind project site, which is currently under construction. Okay, I'm only gonna show two graphs today, I promise. Uh, but they're really central to how we think about this work. This graph is our abatement curve, which we developed during the climate action planning process and now reflects uh, what is, has happened since that time and is updated to 2019. The vertical axis represents emissions, the horizontal axis years. The shades of gray are our fossil fuel emissions from various sources. The plan outlines how we get to net zero direct emissions by 2040 for our operations. We reduce our demand by 31% by 2032. We shift from fossil fuel use to electricity for heating and cooling. That enables us to transition to renewable energy for that energy source. We're going to source 100%, we're, we're going to match 100% of the energy, the electricity needed by the university with renewable energy sources. And we will begin the transition to uh, be, for BU's fleet to electric vehicles. The Center for Computing and Data Sciences is a powerful illustration of one way we can meet uh, these emissions reductions goals by creating buildings that operate carbon free. So let me walk you through how we get to carbon free. If we design this building to be very energy efficient, meeting the Massachusetts Energy Code, it would produce oh, nearly 1.4 million kilograms of CO2 annually. Using strategies to aggressively improve the energy efficiency of the building, we can reduce consumption by about 30%. Using the thermal mass of the earth for heating and cooling, we can eliminate the use of natural gas. Let me repeat that. We can eliminate the use of natural gas in this building. There will be no gas line connected. That is bold and that allows the building to be fossil fuel free. Switching from the energy source from gas to electricity allows us to source that energy from BU wind, and that allows us to be carbon free. I love that. There's nothing there, no carbon. 
This is what we're, what we're after. Geothermal on a dense urban campus like BU is very challenging, especially when you need to drill 31 1500 foot deep wells. Each well is twice, 1500 feet is twice as deep as the John Hancock building is high. All these wells are now complete and construction will resume when the city's moratorium on construction is lifted. I'm pleased to report that the BU Wind Project is well underway at the Triple H Wind Farm in South Dakota. 100% of the wind turbine and power components have been delivered to the site and are waiting to be installed. 46% of the foundations are complete and 8% of the wind turbines are already complete. The project is on track to begin the generation of electricity by the end of this year. This will match 100% of the university's electricity load. Here's a quick video to uh, give you a flavor of the project. This morning, we just received an updated video that shows the towers being stacked. It's pretty cool. You should check it out. You can find it on the BU Win page of the BU Sustainability website. Now back to campus. Two more projects have achieved LEED Gold certification in the past year. The Dehoud Family Alumni Center and Miles Standish Hall. This brings the total LEED certified Base up to over 1.1 million square feet, and 89% of that space has achieved LEED gold. On the electric vehicle front, we are completing the feasibility study for the transition of our fleet to electric and hybrid vehicles over time. This study and implementation recommendations will be finalized early this summer. Efforts are currently underway to address emissions that we do not have direct control over, but result from what we buy, what we waste, and how we move. The development of the zero waste plan has been underway since the fall. Many of you listening on this Zoom forum contributed to that plan. I wanna thank you for your input. It's coming along really well. The plan is actually nearly complete, the Zero Waste Plan reimagines our waste as a resource and will help reduce the university's greenhouse gas emissions. It also addresses the supply chain through recommendations for sustainable purchasing practices. The Climate Action Plan estimated that travel associated with Boston University represents more than 25% more uh, emissions than we, we currently track for operations. We don't have a good handle on it yet, so we're really not able to, to quantify it, uh, and that's part of what we're needing to do. The Climate Action Plan proposed piloting strategies to encourage voluntary purchase of carbon offsets for business travel. BU Sustainability has begun to design such a pilot in collaboration with sourcing procurement, other departments, and other higher ed sustainability partners. BU is working to identify shared opportunities to leverage our engagement in this field. The exciting news is we have really begun to make progress on climate, ch on climate change and sustainability related to, um, uh, related to the curriculum. Boston University currently has 390 courses that include sustainability. This past January, faculty convened a workshop to further help incorporate energy, climate change, and sustainability into every undergraduate student's education. 
approximately 60 faculty and staff from across disciplines gathered to explore ways to integrate sustainability into the classroom and across majors. And the BU Hub Cross College Challenge will have a zero waste project for this fall. As the Climate Action Plan called for, the university launched the Cl Campus Climate Lab last month, led by Professor Hutera in collaboration with BU Research and BU Sustainability. This initiative uses BU the BU campuses as living laboratories to advance sustainability practices and implement the Climate Action Plan. The Campus Climate Lab provides funding to support student research, as well as increase interdisciplinary collaboration among students, faculty, and staff. Let me say a few words about BU's leadership. In December, at the groundbreaking for the Center for Computing and Data Sciences, Mayor Walsh talked about how Boston University is a climate leader, and the Center for Computing and Data Sciences is a symbol for climate leadership. He sees the center as a leading example for sustainable design and an important solution for helping the city meet its climate action goals to achieve zero emissions by 2050. The week after groundbreaking, Mayor Walsh announced through an executive order that all new municipal buildings will be carbon free. We are extremely fortunate to be a part of a city with such strong climate leadership. So yes, Boston University is continuing to implement the Climate Action Plan through the coronavirus disruption. COVID-19 has a profound impact, has had a profound impact on humanity around the world. It is exposing vulnerabilities of our society, government, and economy. What I am interested in is understanding what we can learn from this pressure test on our resilience and apply those lessons to the existential threat of climate change and help our society be more resilient in the future. With that, I would like to turn this back to Lisa Tornatar, our sustainability director, to moderate the panel or to introduce the, the panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Sure, now let me figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> that was great, I really appreciate that. And I wanna say that I'm really proud to be a part of this BU Sustainability team. And, you know, there's great progress that's happening at Boston University, and I hope that's what everyone got out of your presentation. I am going to share my screen as well and introduce Natalie Bennett. Natalie Bennett is one of our interns. I'm really happy to um, have some of our students participating today. Natalie is a senior in the College of Arts and Sciences and a news reporter for BU TV 10. And she will be moderating our panel today. And I will let her introduce uh, Dr. John Levy and Dr. Suchi Gopal. Thank you, Lisa and Dennis, and thank you to everyone who is tuning in to celebrate BU Earth Day today. I'm really looking forward to moderating this event. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists um, who will be joining Dennis today. So first, Dr. Sucharita Gopal is a professor in the Department of Earth and Environment and a research fellow at the Global Development Policy Center, the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future, and the Institute for Sustainable Energy. Her research deals with spatial analysis and modeling, GIS, data mining, and more to address a variety of problems in biology, environmental science, public health, and business. Some of her current projects include conservation planning in Cambodia and Florida, mapping natural gas leaks and network resiliency in Boston, and COVID-19 diffusion mapping and modeling. So thank you so much, Dr. Gopal, for joining us. And also we have Dr. Jonathan Levy. He is a professor and chair of environmental health at Boston University School of Public Health. 
his research centers on urban environmental exposure and health risk modeling with an emphasis on exposure patterns and related environmental justice issues. He has been a member of several National Research Council committees, including the Committee on Science for EPA's Future, the Committee on Health Impact Assessment, and the Committee on Improving Risk Analysis approaches used by the US EPA. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Levy. Now, before jumping into the questions, we want to hear a little bit more from the panelists themselves. So, Dr. Gopal, can you tell us what you're working on right now? So my current work is uh, looking at many aspects of climate change, and we are in the process of building a platform which looks at the environmental impacts, the social impacts, as well as the governance impacts of things related with climate change. So this is a data platform that brings in all the data that you need applies all kinds of models and provides uh, metrics for resilience, for assessing vulnerability and so on. So this project comes closest to Earth Day and I think it would be of great use to countries, it would be use, of great use to mayors and states and so on. And we are trying to work with uh, agencies like the United Nations in addressing their SDG needs, sustainable development goals, and how can they formulate these goals? How can they go about measuring if they have achieved these goals? What is the action plan and what is the governance needed to make sure that everything is implemented you know, effectively? So that's one project. And right now, the reason um, you know, my students are all involved in various projects, again, to do with climate change. We are looking at uh, Lyme disease, uh, looking at, uh, you know, looking at habitats like salamanders, uh, who are, uh, you know, which is being impacted because of forest uh, cover expansion. And of course, uh, mapping of COVID. And you understand that COVID is to do with also signals of deforestation and climate change as we clear more and more trees and deforest, it looks like we are coming into more and more contact with these wild animals that are then traded and we are exposed to it, vulnerabilities. So I think I'm going to stop there and maybe take questions later. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, now, Dr. Levy, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? Sure. Thanks. And, and welcome, everybody. It's always hard to speak virtually where you can't see the audience, but we'll, we'll all do our best. So I, mean, I guess my work connects with climate in a couple of key ways. So one, we do a lot of work looking on, at the health co-benefits of climate action. In other words, if you take actions to address climate change using renewable energy, energy efficiency, and so forth, you also are going to reduce air pollutants that have near-term health benefits. And sometimes the, quantifying those benefits can be an important part of developing city, state, or federal policy and justifying action. So we've done a number of mo modeling studies over the years and, and in recent times looking at different policy instruments that are trying to reduce our carbon footprint and articulating what the health implications of, of those might be. And another, another thread of research, uh, one of the things I do is co-direct an environmental health disparities research center at the School of Public Health uh, that is uh, co-directed uh, between Boston University and Harvard. And we're focused on Massachusetts with a hyper-local focus on both Chelsea and Dorchester. And there we're thinking about a number of exposures that have connections to climate, air pollution being one, but also heat exposure and exposure to green space and trying to understand exposure patterns and the health implications across the lifespan, ranging from birth outcomes, things like low birth weight to childhood growth and development, all the way up to cardiovascular disease among older adults. So really trying to understand these effects. And, and I think where it all ties together and like Suchi, it connects to COVID is understanding some aspects of housing and the built environment and how they can influence our exposures. Clearly right now we're, we're in a time period where we are all sheltered in place. We are at home and our, our exposure patterns are, are truly being influenced by 
the four walls around us and our surrounding neighborhoods and surrounding communities. So stop there and, and happy to elaborate in the conversation. Perfect, thank you, looking forward to it. Well, now we can jump into some of the questions that we have and also to a reminder to the audience that they can drop in questions to the Q&A box as we're going through if there's anything that pops up that you're curious about. So as we mentioned, this is kind of discussing the intersection between COVID-19, sustainability, climate change. Um, and given the search, current situation, people have definitely been impacted in different ways. Um, I was curious how your guys' individual research has been impacted um, recently. Dr. Levy, if you want to start. Sure. So, I mean, there, there's a number of levels of that. So some of it is just the you know, the day-to-day -day human activity of what, what can you do on research. And, you know, we do a lot of work with human subjects or measuring air pollution inside of people's homes. Those activities clearly can't happen right now. So there's an operational effect. But I, I think probably the more profound effect is thinking across all of our different studies about this, you know, unique and horrible natural experiment we're going through and understanding the implications for health. So, you know, for example, we have studies that are looking at air pollution in and around the Boston area and doing some source attribution. Air pollution patterns have changed precipitously right now. It means that any measurements we take now would not have a lot of generalizability, but as I suspect we might talk about later, might tell us something about where with cleaner technologies we could get in the future. So there, there's value in that work. Probably the most sort of substantive and I, I think, you know, important thing we've been grappling with, you know, I mentioned our Environmental Health Disparity Center, it's focus on Chelsea. I think anyone who's read the paper in the last couple of weeks knows Chelsea is really the hardest hit community in Massachusetts right now from COVID because of a confluence of vulnerability factors, having a lot of frontline workers or people who are considered as essential workers, crowded housing, the most densely populated city in Massachusetts. And so we are studying it for environmental health disparities because of those precise set of factors that are now making it most vulnerable to COVID. So we're we're trying to figure out how we can take our research architecture and use it to benefit the population of Chelsea and other similar communities. So not not sort of stopping by saying, well, we can we can describe for you the communities that are hard hit because A, we all know that, and B, that doesn't help specifically, but seeing if some of our data can help in, in the process, as well as engaging with some of our study participants and our community partners to perhaps get a little bit more information about what people are going through right, right now. And again, trying to use that in some way that can inform potential interventions. And, and I guess one specific thing that we're thinking quite a bit about is the summer, right? I think we're obviously that we don't know where things will go with COVID over the summer, but if people are socially isolated in their homes and they lack air conditioning and they lack access to cooling centers and so forth, you're sort of at the perfect storm of conditions that can contribute to adverse effects of heat waves. So we're trying to figure out how to grapple with that question, how to understand it, and hopefully how to prevent some potential health challenges that could come down the line. Right, and um, Dr. Kapal, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I think you're on mute. Um, my research focused on Southeast Asia and we have field trips with our students every summer to Indonesia. And of course, all of that got canceled. So there we have spent a lot of time studying other regions of the world in terms of public health crises, looking at land subsidence, looking at sea level change in Indonesia. We are now sort of uh, coming to understand what is it that we failed in terms of the United States, in terms of what should, have, what should the preparation have been. And one of the things that we are noticing, of course, there are many failures, but one thing that we are noticing is the data availability. There's a lot of data available, you know, spatial data that I deal with in terms of building a database, but there's been very little effort in trying to understand how do we sort of take care of a pandemic, you know, sort of a buildup. 
because we need not just health data, we need social data that John was, Jonathan was pointing out to, uh, social disparities, we need insurance data, we need you know, age-related, race-related, income-related, employment. So many pieces of things have to come together because every governor, every mayor has to understand how to put it all together in order to do the um, economic adjustment that's going to be needed. How many places are you going to you know, open up for business and how do you do that? How do you monitor? What are the actions and mitigation steps and containment uh, policies that have to be put in place? How are you going to measure what the efficacy is and whether it's working and what's not working? So uh, we are trying to get this kind of understanding of a cohesive database. And we are also noting that there's a lot of issues that we haven't thought about even in terms of uh, modeling because we always assume that we would know the denominator of the number of people who are infected. In this case, we have no idea because there's no testing. So how do you mathematically sort of come up with a model that addresses and comes up with some kind of estimate in the absence of everything else for the next couple of months? And so there is a lot of different issues that one has to deal with to cope with this. And we want to help uh, states and agencies uh, you know, uh, to deal with all kinds of actions, including how to help small business, what should remain open, what should be shut, and who should be the next person to open up their business. So it is uh, a big challenge. Uh, having done work elsewhere, coming to the United States and trying to uh, sort of get familiar with what's available, what's not, has been a big one for research for me. Right, thank you so much. And so you both have uh, quite extensive experience in mapping technologies. Um, are you able to apply that to COVID-19 and what general trends have you, or patterns have you noticed? So I can uh, answer that first, Jonathan, and then you can you know, jump in. So um, everything in terms of COVID-19, uh, there are pieces of census information health information and a lot of things available. But they're all available at different spatial scales. Because health information has privacy associated with it, I can never get to know which is the patient and what zip code they lived in in order to know the health consequences because that's against you know, uh, what we do in terms of research. But then I need to know each individual person and that's why apps that Google and Apple are making, which is the, uh, you know, which can trace who you are in touch with, who are in, you are in contact with, if you let yourself open and choose to share that information, seems kind of useful. There are other companies that are providing other pieces of information that are equally useful. One measures fever and it produces a fever map for every day of the US, uh, you know, of all populations. So I am using that type of data to understand how to uh, see what the spread of COVID is because I don't have anything else real to go on. So I think you know there's a lot that one can do and because there's so many unknowns. So, and I've done, we are doing a lot of tremendous, uh, uh, you know, different pieces of information are being put together to get at what can be given and what would be useful. And one has to be careful because there's so much uncertainty, not knowing the denominator. And this is where science, I mean, we are unable to communicate that, you know, it's all the models that we build is dependent on data. And if you don't have the data, we, there is uncertainty margins and we are not able to communicate uncertainty all that well. Right now I'm working with two professors in the department of math who are experts in uncertainty quantification. So that's needed, I think. Great, thank you. Dr. Levy, anything to add? Sure, I mean, just to build on those comments, I mean, we similarly in environmental health you know, use a lot of geospatial data about both environmental and social stressors. And so my colleague, uh, Patricia Fabian, who's affiliated with our Environmental Health Disparities Center has been building up a vulnerability geospatial database, you know, leveraging data that we have and trying to connect it to the COVID crisis. So really thinking based on CDC guidance, based on the peer reviewed literature, 
what are the factors that make one more vulnerable to the health effects of COVID if one becomes infected or more likely to be exposed to COVID given your job, for example, or just the, the built environment around you. And so, you know, she's created in RTIS a, a story map that puts all that information together and, and makes it public. And then we're going to attempt to use those data to better understand you know, patterns of disease spread among adjacent communities, time trend of time trends of the outcomes. You know, I, I think as as Suchi alluded to, just trying to best utilize the limited public data available, which have a lot of uncertainties and errors to be able to at least advance the conversation and inform some kind of decision making and, and with an eye toward both the very near term, right? This is a dynamic day-to-day -day situation where, you know, some some analyses two weeks from now would no longer be useful. So what can we do in the near term? But also keeping an eye on the long term. Right? This could recur in the fall or the winter. You know, other pandemics could be on the horizon many years from now. And so what kind of data do we need to understand and hopefully anticipate future challenges so that we can mitigate and address them in, in a smart way? Definitely. Dennis, did you have something to add? Yeah, I'd like to actually have a follow-up with, with John and Suchi uh, regarding, you know, the under-reporting of, of coronavirus data. Uh, clearly, there isn't enough testing, so we don't have any under understanding of what the denominator is in how we think about this. Uh, I saw this morning uh, just in the news in a news feed uh, that Los Angeles County residents uh, of Los Angeles County residents um, that suggest under reporting of uh, 28 to 55 times. I don't know if you guys have seen that report. I just saw it like again in my news feed, but um, I'm curious how with time we can look back uh, and and use other data sources like that to help us help inform uh, a better understanding of of the situation we're currently in. I, so I could take a, a first crack. I mean, it, the first thing I'd say broadly is that you know. A, I don't want to get too far out of my lane. And I think if there's anything the COVID pandemic has taught us is there's a lot of armchair epidemiologists in the world and people who like to, to make plots and probably wander too far out. And, and this is probably out of the edge of, of my knowledge base and beyond. But you know, that, that being said, I, one, one thing I think it does shed a light on, this maybe is slightly tangential to what you're saying, but still a value is just, how we utilize data and data when there's considerable uncertainty. And I think as the, the data from Los Angeles came out and, and a lot of people who know a lot more than I do about it have pointed out challenges and concerns. For example, if you have a test that has a certain amount of false positives and false negatives, which any, any test would have, that could contribute large uncertainties in, in these estimates. So there's kind of two, two different layers here. Like one, one is how do we best utilize and communicate the data that we have and the second is you know how do we do these types of things that have happened in los angeles chelsea did an analogous thing that you may have seen in the paper a few days ago which came out with i think of the people who came which may not be a representative sample i think 33 percent tested positive and so you know, i think we're starting to see data streams from a number of places that clearly indicate you know a substantial underestimate of, of the denominator you know, I think we have to sort of proceed with caution before leaping at one set of numbers, especially if it's on a, a sort of self-selected people and overgeneralizing. But it, you know, I think one of the good things that's happening right now is a lot of people are trying to collect and understand data and synthesize it in, in new ways. And hopefully that gives us, I guess, better strategies for understanding things in the long term and just better ways of interpreting the data that we have right now. Great. Thanks, John. Great, thank you so much. Um, this question is also for everyone. Um, the pandemic has been, there's been a lot of discussion around vulnerable populations, the effect um, COVID-19 has had on vulnerable populations. How has it influenced how we address these issues and also the relation to climate change, if anyone wants to take that? So um, I can sort of take that. So in terms of climate change, we are always 
concerned about food security, water security, and increasingly, of course, energy security. So all of these problems, especially the food security, is going to be impacted the world over as the supply chains are all impacted at this point of bringing food from rural areas into urban areas. You already see farmers in the US who are unable to bring in the, the fresh produce that they have or even the milk into the cities because they're the pe people that they supply to, which is the restaurants and the school districts and the colleges and so on, are not buying that anymore. So they don't have ways and means of packaging that, freezing that and resending it because it's going to cost them more money to develop that part of the supply chain. So one of the things that we noticed in discussing about climate change is that it has to be locally sourced. I know I work with many students on these locally sourced, you know, uh, vegetables and fruits and how do we sort of, you know, have a smaller footprint in terms of food. And that seems to sort of come to mind because we are going to see massive ramifications in terms of the supply chain of food, even in the United States, let, let alone other countries. So I think we need to, we are going to, you know, come into a new understanding of a new world, which is the world that we were talking about in relation to climate change. And that has become the harsh reality, you know, of what's happening with COVID. So as Jonathan pointed out before, I always wondered about talking about carbon and asthma and all those kinds of health issues and decarbonizing, you know, Massachusetts or decarbonizing Boston. And we could not perform experiments to show how the level of emissions comes down when there's no traffic on the road. We could only simulate it and sort of say, oh, yeah, well, you know, nobody is driving on a Sunday. We will use that data. Now we have real data to try out so many things with climate change. Look at the harsh parallels that between what we are in and what is the world in terms of, you know, having that kind of climate change, you know, study. So for me, I'm sort of seeing it's providing me fresh new perspectives of all things that we were discussing in a kind of a theoretical realm, at least for the United States. And we are seeing it play out. And so that's the connection, I think. Great, great, thank you. Dr. Levy, yeah. so, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, building, just building upon that, I mean, I think what we're seeing is, you know, the same populations are vulnerable to a host of different stressors. And, and this is nothing new. And, you know, you could just substitute in any environmental, social, economic stressor, and there, it's the same populations that are disproportionately affected. So, you know, we created heat vulnerability maps for Massachusetts, and there are analogous ones for other urban areas. You know, you wouldn't be surprised to learn that the places most vulnerable to the effects of heat, and therefore some of the effects of climate change, are also the ones who are most vulnerable to COVID-19. And, and if you layer in, you know, unstable housing or inadequate access to healthcare, it, it's the same map, right? And so that that's, I think, one of the just broad societal challenges that we face. And I think Dennis alluded to this earlier that, you know, COVID has really just laid bare, you know, that there are populations that are disproportionately affected, that are underserved and they're disadvantaged, and that, you know, we need to find better ways to address the underlying conditions rather than kind of putting a Band-Aid on each time or each time being surprised to learn that, you know, certain communities are being disproportionately affected. You know, when the, the first city by city reports came out in the globe, I think last week, once the state started reporting city by city data in Massachusetts, you know, I don't think anyone was shocked to see which communities were at the top of the list when the next, you know, hurricane, heat wave, so forth come through. And, and this is not just a Massachusetts or US story, it's a broader story. You know, it, it will be the same populations will be affected and and hopefully, you know, we will have done something to prevent it, or certainly, hopefully, we will not be shocked to see the exact same thing manifesting over and over again, and, and can be a little bit more anticipatory, and hopefully, can help help to reduce some of these effects. Dennis, anything to add? Or? I think the I think both John and Suchi did a great job of explaining that. I feel like one one thing I would add is 
know, climate change is a force multiplier. And those things that, that are, we're seeing now are just going to become more and more apparent as climate change continues to create the pressures of rising temperatures and, you know, storms and all, everything else. So, you know, I think, I think if we can learn from this, how to help reduce the stresses on those populations, it's going to really help us be more resilient as a society. So I, I just wanted to add one thought with what Dennis was saying there. It's climate change and it's also producing mass migrations and deforestation and all other kind of unintended and intended consequences as people begin to move and people are deforesting or they are letting other people come in and deforest for them because they want to develop their uh, resources like Southeast Asia, coal and hydro. They need all the power that they can get to establish their factories. So I would also imagine that along with climate change, the consequences of mass migration, climate refugees, which is on the rise, as well as increasingly we are seeing globalization. And this is the globalization of supply chains. So every country, even if the US is sort of not directly impacted, is going to feel the indirect impacts of this uh, you know, uh, climate change from elsewhere through its supply chains. Great, thank you so much. So um, we kind of alluded to it in the last question, but there's obviously um, some similarities with COVID-19 and the climate change crisis. What do you guys think would be should be the biggest takeaways or maybe a lesson learned through the unprecedented situation that we're in right now or climate change in the future so one of the I mean, I, go ahead go ahead jonathan please oh, go sorry ahead. Um, yeah so yeah I'll, I'll be brief i mean i i guess i i could pick two i mean one which is fairly obvious, but I, I think is worth saying out loud is just our global interconnectedness, right? And, you know, for COVID-19, you could say, you know, every country in the world is doing a great job and one is not, but, you know, the virus does not know borders. You can't build a wall to contain it. We are a global society with global transport and global goods, you know, moving about. And so if one country is doing a lousy job, it will circulate around the world. And, and I think there are analogs with climate change where, you know, nobody can do it alone, right? Any one country is one part of an entire global story. So one, one country cannot solve it by themselves. And at the same time, you know, one country stepping outside of the global decision-making process causes complicated and, and undesirable ripple effect. So they, it has to be tackled on a global scale. I mean, I think the other clear similarity is about, you know, bring it really back down to the local scale, because, you know, we can talk about global decision making, but at the end of the day, you know, there are mayors trying to figure out what to do, governors, communities who are trying to act, and how prepared are we with our local infrastructure to deal with disasters? You know, how, what are the, what do the public health agencies look like in, you know, small cities? How are things decided on a local and regional scale? Are communities prepared for the next bad thing that might happen? And so, you know, preparedness, public health preparedness, seems like sort of a, a boring and, and theoretical thing until you actually need it. And then you suddenly really are bemoaning the fact that you lack the infrastructure to to deal with some of these challenges. So I, I think, again, COVID has, has emphasized that we, and we meaning really the global community, were sort of woefully underprepared for a crisis of this scale and magnitude. And I think there are analogous things you could say about any of the litany of effects of climate change that we are, we are not prepared to deal with the crises and to manage it at the local community scale. Paul, do you have anything to add to that or Jenna? Suchi, do you have something you want to add? You look like you're ready to say something. So no, I was just thinking, I was reiterating the same thing that we said before, 
we were trying to convince the entire world of what is to happen with climate change by looking at food and water security and people's livelihoods and things. And you see the same parallel happening as with COVID. And it's almost like you can see what's going to happen if you don't pay attention to what's happening right now and use this as like a test bed to understand the larger things that is to come with climate change in this century. I think this is like the place to start with in order to uh, put a real brains, like a global perspective, everybody joined together and to make sure that we take care of each other. And as Jonathan was pointing out, it's a global community. It's not each country to their own. We need to work with everybody else in order to solve this problem. I'd like to add to that. I think both John and Suchi had some really good points. And one of the things I'm most concerned about uh, with respect to climate change is how we uh, work to prepare ourselves for those impacts from climate change and working collaboratively across boundaries. The landscape, the natural landscape is, is not at all related to uh, the uh, jurisdictional boundaries we humans have put on the landscape in terms of city to city, state to state, country to country. Many times they are, you know, a riverway or a, a, a ridge line, but often they're not. And water from sea level rise or heavy storms does not respect those boundaries. And if we're going to be successful here, one of the most important things for us to do is to build working relationships across those jurisdictional boundaries so that we can work together to solve these problems. And I think at a local level, the city of Boston and the Metro Mayor's Coalition is a perfect example of what we need to be doing. Uh, there are 14 cities around Boston that are working together to address these issues. And this is the beginning, but I think we have to do a lot better job uh, at all these different scales if we're going to really be successful in addressing these issues. Definitely great. Thank you so much. We're going to um, answer a couple audience questions now. We have a few responses in. Um, this one is kind of touching on what we've been talking about, about going back to normal. And so Chelsea asked, what do you see as the most promising avenue for advocacy on climate action right now, especially in terms of capitalizing on the pollution reduction that we're seeing? We won't all be telecommuting, avoiding all unnecessary travel, um, but can we skillfully reopen in a way that is more long-term sustainable and has a better environmental impact? So if uh, Dr. Levy or Dr. Kapal or Dennis wanna take that, so I can sort of, uh, I'm sure Dennis has a lot of ideas on this one, but let me uh, sort of take a crack at it. I would say that for many businesses, I'm listening to a lot of uh, different conversations, not just of governors and mayors, but also business leaders. For the first time, they are sort of articulating the vision that much of the work could also be done remote you don't have to be driving in all five days. And that I think in some ways is a very measured response to climate change. You know, not all of us need to be driving, be driving in. We could drive in three days a week even, you know, and not all the five days. And that provides some, you know, relief. And I have heard people also talk about air travel, which has got the biggest carbon footprint. And Having these remote calls and Zooms have proved that, you know, people all across the globe on different time zones could all work with each other. So there are a lot of advantages to think about the fact that we don't have to do a daily commute, you know, all five days a week. And that I think is one kind of a measured response that I'm already beginning to sort of have people talk about and see a articulate a vision for what to do in the future. Let me add to that, Suchi. I, th I think uh, you're, you said pretty much where I was going, but as an architect, I think about uh, all the built space we have and 
I, I wonder if through our experience in this COVID-19 world we're in, everybody's going to be very good. Everybody already is very good about how to use Zoom and other communication strategies that were not well, not deeply integrated into business practices as they are now by, ne by necessity. Uh, so I think we may well have a lower need uh, for office space um, in our cities and therefore a lower need for commuting. Uh, and part of this would be through hoteling space. In other words, shared office space. Uh, so, you know, you, you have two people that share the same space alternate days or who, who knows? I mean, there's a million different models, but I think space as well as, so there's a reduced carbon footprint using need, needing less space. Um, the flip side of that is we're all occupying space still, right? Our energy bills in our homes, I'm sure are gonna look a lot bigger this month for last month than they were the month before. Um, so it's, it's interesting to kind of think about how all this is gonna play out, but the new normal is gonna be a very different normal than I think we've been familiar with. Yeah, and, and just building on that, I, I agree with all the, the prior points, and I think there are really opportunities in this sort of, you know, grotesque natural experiment to look at things that, you know, people, you know, as I stated, you know, boy, there's some meetings we could easily do on Zoom. We didn't have to fly across the country for a half an hour talk. You know, this this works just fine. The piece that I'm I keep thinking about are some of the sort of the unintended consequences that could go run counter to climate goals you know for example is there going to be a fear of living in more densely packed urban areas and kind of a, a new sort of push for moving to the exurbs and kind of being far away from people and does that then induce more traffic and, and more travel so you could imagine that you know there's also certain jobs clearly that you can do on zoom and some where you have to be physically present at all times and so you know, for those jobs where people have to be physically there five days a week, you know, are we ensuring that we have the right structures and systems in place for them to do so? And, you know, the, my related concern is maybe people fear, fear urbanization. People also may fear public transportation and saying, I don't want to be in a densely packed green line car. I'm fearful of being close to those people. So are we going to have more induced driving? And then you're going to have more people on the roads, at least for a subset of people, and and that creates sort of this countervailing effect. It, I, you know, I think broadly, right, we know that a lot of the functions of society are going to be remapped in a host of different ways after this, and and some of them are easy to anticipate, and some of them are difficult to anticipate. And to me, the challenge is how, as we're all trying to reconstruct ourselves after this, do we keep an eye on the long term and you know, avoid a situation where people, you know, in an extreme case, you know, empty out the cities and start driving, you know, 50 miles into work because they don't want to, again, be, be living or taking public transportation near other people. So I wanted to add one point to what Jonathan said before. This is also showing the digital divide. People in poorer communities have no access to the internet, the high-speed internet they need, let alone have computers. In Boston, uh, school teachers were going in door to door, dropping off PCs, you know, so they can participate in the remote education. So I think then as one of the things that's going to happen is this idea of, you know, providing a true, true a digital infrastructure that I think would become even more critical at this point, especially to the poorer communities, because they cannot participate in this kind of uh, space and technology and you know everything being remote without having the internet connectivity the high-speed internet connectivity definitely thank you so much everyone for that input shifting now more um another question from an audience member looking at institutional effects sarah asked sustainability generally comes at an additional cost to institutions municipalities and businesses as covid 19 strains budgets how may that impact how sustainability will be prioritized in the next months or years 
so if you sort of think of COVID-19 as uh, a risk factor, it's a financial risk. And every company, every state, every county has to consider such possibilities in the future. And they have to be prepared in terms of a response. So in an economical sense or in a financial investment sense, they are much better placed you know, with a lower risk profile. So I think this is going to be the way, you know, that'll be like the new norm of going forward and sustainability. And this is the platform that we were trying to build in, which is called ESG, Environment, Social and Governance. Some companies and some investment, mutual funds and so on, already considering this. Previously, it was called social investing. Now it is called ESG because ESG produces its own set of risk. And if you are very smart and forward looking and you're not about tied to 20th century, but to 21st century, you do have to consider sustainability and you do have to consider those types of risk in your planning. I think just to quickly build on that, I feel like the challenges in the near term are, are really capital expenses. I think you know the economy has come to a, a grinding halt at the moment. It's going to take time to get back up to speed. And I don't know if it'll really ever return to the speed that it has been at. Um, but the, the, the challenge is in where we put our money now. Um, but because uh, of the economics of sustainability, the benefits always or yeah, the benefits always come out at the end through, through the process over time. Um, but we're seeing a lot of, you know, savings. So financial savings through lower energy bills, lower waste, all these things uh, can help us in the long term. But I think it comes with good planning. And I think a real rethink now based on, on the COVID-19 situation what is it going to look like and how do we how do we address that i mean i also think obviously we're in like the height of acute crisis mode right now and so i mean right now is a, a difficult time to see the horizon but i mean i think and and now i'm sort of speaking you know as an economist which i am not so i'm again, wandering a little little far out on the limb but yeah you know, i would think you know if if you look back at other historical calamitous events and crashes, you know, it's the companies and the societies and the cities that made smart long-term investments at these times of crisis that made it out the back end. And the ones that sort of panicked and had just near-term decision-making are the ones that faltered. And so, you know, I would imagine places that have their eyes on the horizon and say, okay, we've got to get through this current capital crisis. But, you know, when opportunity arises to make a smart investment with a long-term payout, right? You do so at a time when you can get, you know, inexpensive loans, you know, take, you know, advantage of low interest rates, whatever else, you know, you make the investments now, you don't eat your seed corn and, you know, you're, you're well positioned for the long term. And I feel like that's what a lot of these sustainability practices really offer. Again, with some off, upfront expenditure, oftentimes you are both gaining economically in the long term and making yourself more, resilient to shocks, healthier and, and greater well-being. So yeah, I imagine you'll you'll see some shakeout with some winners and losers, but I, I think places that make those sort of smart, medium to long-term investments, you know, you'll look at them in 2030 and say, boy, they, they didn't falter at a key moment. They had their eyes, you know, on the long term and, and they're the ones who were successful. So right. I would like to add a little bit of history to that. So the previous uh, you know, the 2000 crash led to the internet revolution. And that's what led to all the things that we see today on the internet in terms of businesses, including Amazon, right? It rose out of those ashes. So I think this particular crash of what is happening right now shows you that we could come up with all kinds of ideas for sustainable small businesses and things geared, things we have not even thought about because we need to think out of the box to deal with the pandemic. And this probably is a very good opportune moment to come up with new types of businesses. 
that are more geared towards addressing sustainability and also addressing income uh, you know disparities great thank you so much uh, this is another question coming in from our audience members uh, directed for Dr. Levy. Um, wondering what the typical numbers for death rates for pollution related conditions like respiratory illness, skin cancers, et cetera, and how those compare to COVID-19 um, death rates. And if there's anything you have to add about alleviating this um, pressure from, from environmental conditions, if you want to take that, Dr. Levy. Sure. So, I mean, it's it's a tough question, obviously. Yeah, I think there, there have been data that have shown, you know, COVID as a cause of death in relation to other common causes of death, just using sort of typical average rates and showing that, you know, in, in the early days, you know, in March, you know, COVID was trivial compared to other causes. It's now risen, at least in places like New York City, Boston, other hard hit communities. It's risen up to be higher than the rates of death from anything else. So it, it's surpassing any other cause. What that will look like on an annual basis is hard to say. But I think where it lines back up with, you know, kind of environmental health and environmental stressors is, you know, many of the diseases that we're seeing related to COVID are also those that are affected by air pollution. So, you know, respiratory disease is an obvious one. But, you know, you're seeing effects on the heart, cardiovascular effects of COVID, which we've seen from air pollution. And so, you know, when, you know, in conversations with COVID, there was discussions of, oh, it's surprising we're seeing cardiovascular effects. You know, air pollution epidemiologists said, well, that's not surprising at all. We've known for 20, 30 years that although you inhale air pollution, it has these systemic effects, including on the cardiovascular system. So it's, you know, the interplay between these stressors is, complicated and and challenging but i think it points out that you know a cleaner environment cleaner outdoor air cleaner indoor air would actually make us more resilient to the effects of covid now or any other future respiratory virus respiratory pandemic right dr gupal or dennis anything to add to that one no, okay. Um, and good job. And another question from an audience member is um, how can we as individuals and or sustainability professionals help shape what this new normal that we've been talking about um, looks like on a larger scale? Dr. Levy, you're muted. I think one of the things that I am sort of discussing with my students is this idea that I was mentioning before that we are no longer sort of bound to uh, country boundaries. We need to think much larger and take a much more global perspective on any type of problem that we deal with to understand all those connections. And also in terms of sustainability, it's not always, you know, in traditional economics, we've always talked about money and you know things to do with what's the profit but in sustainability there seem to be some fuzzier sort of concepts you know even things like how do you measure the wellness factor you know health and wellness how would you sort of come up with some sort of measurement um, and it's the same thing with sustainability i find it very hard to pinpoint and define things like resiliency how do I define something resilient that, you know, in this uh, world of sustainability and what I need to describe as metrics? So I think we need to think different. We need to incorporate factors, uh, data points that we never looked at before, all in our understanding of, you know, sustainability. And I think Jonathan spoke about mental health before. Uh, that's obviously also very critical. Uh, thinking about the new normal, um, I would expect that we need to be much more global and much more inclusive of things that we never considered before as being part of this new normal of what we need to, you know, uh, uh, use to guide us, uh, guide our actions in the future. Suchi, I hope you yeah. join us for the second half of the session on the with the wellness piece. I think it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Segue to that. Um, I think um, to, to get to the question, I, one of the things that I feel um, 
is really around resilience and social resilience that we're we're seeing these incredible impacts on our result and our ability to to uh to bounce back um and i think it's going to be a tough bounce i think um it's going to be well i see this as an opportunity which i mentioned earlier for us to actually observe how resilient we are in this situation and look at how we can connect that resilience to climate resilience um, because it's the people we need that need to be resilient ultimately and everything the environment the built environment how that supports our resilience um, so i'm really interested to and i'm trying to i'm working with others to to look at ways uh, we can think about that resilience. Uh, working with the University Climate Change Coalition, small group within, the, within that group, uh, looking at this very question. How do we learn lessons about resilience now that we can apply to resilience on climate change in the, in the near future? Yeah. I mean, I also think, I mean, this is so, complicated and multi-dimensional. I, you know, I don't want to sort of focus on just one piece of it, but I, I will anyways, because I, I spent a lot of time thinking about housing as you know, a lot of my research intersects with housing. And to me, it's such a fundamental aspect of where we are right now in thinking about COVID. Obviously, we are spending most of our time inside our home. If you're thinking about possibility of transmission within family units that comes down to how is your home constructed how densely packed is it do you have you know if if it's stated that you need to quarantine someone in your household can you do that if you live in a one bedroom apartment versus a mansion that's a very different story and you know some an important part of climate resilience also comes back to housing you know do you have you know air conditioning do you have a home that is resilient to storms. You know, there's so many different dimensions where where you live can have a profound effect on your health and your well-being, your ability to protect yourself from a variety of different kinds of stressors. So I think those of us who are interested in sustainability, I, I think it's valuable to think, you know, as we come out the back end of this, as, as people are thinking about retrofitting their homes or thinking of new home how, home construction, not just where should these be built, but what should they be built to do? How do you grapple with the desire to have a place that airs out very well so that if you've got some virus indoors, you're airing it out versus the desire to have a, a home that's a bit tighter to be energy efficient. And there's, of course, solutions to these things that, you know, Dennis and others know, you know far better than I do. But you know, keeping all these various kinds of stressors in mind as we're thinking about the home environment, obviously it's gonna be beneficial for health, for resilience, and just for people's state of mind and knowing that they're living in a home that can sort of best protect them from all the vagaries of different kinds of stressors out there. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and then another question from an audience member. Uh, we've been talking a lot about potential behavior change and um, what this new normal is supposed to look like after um, the COVID-19 situation, but this attendee asked, what about businesses wanting to go back to back to business as usual um, and how to address unsustainable practices that they look to continue after all of this? Anyone wants to take on that question? So if you sort of look at um, business as usual, most businesses are going to be surprised that it is not going to be business as usual because a lot of people are fearful of going to a restaurant, doing something that they normally would have done, right? So I think that all businesses are prepared. There's one thing that they don't understand is how many people are going to show up. They may appear on the beaches, they may sort of want to do recreational fishing and so on, you know, out there in the open, that's fine. But actually participating in something like that is also, um, I think is questionable because we still don't know how people are going to behave. And the fear factor means what are people doing to, um, you know, make sure that they have 
enough money for their retirement or enough money uh, for the next day. I did it teach something about economic, uh, you know, livelihoods, how much they should spend and what is to happen, those kinds of issues on financial, you know, security is another sort of question. Uh, but I think the, you know, businesses, uh, you know, like even airline business is already looking at whether the shape of the recovery is going to be a V shape or whether it's going to be a prolonged U shape. Meaning if it's a U shape, we could be at the bottom for almost a year before we pick up and go back to recovery. So, and that recovery will not be, many people know that it may not be the old days before pre-COVID days, um, something will change in society. So that's one of the things that people are beginning to talk about. And I think Jonathan spoke to one interesting point about public transport. People are very fearful of using public transport. Are they all going to go in and buy cars? And I see a lot of car commercials because they're all hoping you don't have to pay for the next three months, buy a car is the ad I see now, right? Or, you know, advertising such that they make it very tempting for you to buy a car because you don't want to, you know, go into public transport. And one of the things there would be messaging. How safe is the public transport? What are the new protocols put in place such that everything is wiped clean and you can be assured of safety? And how should you behave, you know, with the gloves and the mask? So there's all those things that are going to skirt around this issue that you're asking of resuming or coming back to the new norm. Great, thank you. Uh, Dennis or Dr. Levy, anything to add to that one? I, th I think the new normal is gonna be very, very different than the old normal. I, you know, we, we, at this point, we have no way of knowing what it's going to look like. I think the, the challenge, I mean, of course, we all want to get back to normal, right? Um, but, you know, we have 22 million people that have applied for unemployment. Um, you know, that smashes the records from before. And it's going to take time to get back economically to whatever this new normal is. It's going to take years. I think, you know, the sooner we can get out of this, the better, but we can't do that prematurely because we're going to be back in this if, if we're going to learn from uh, the Spanish flu, at least, you know, that second bounce was, was worse than the first. So we need to be careful about how we get back. And I think if we get back healthy and safely, then we can start to figure out what this new normal is going to be. Definitely. Dr. Levy, anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, just that, you know, it, some of it is good old fashioned supply and demand, right? So if, if people are not demanding, you know, sort of a, a quote, unquote, you know, old normal service, and that's what you roll back out, once things open back up, your business will fail. And so I think, you know, all it's incumbent on all businesses, and not just businesses, you know, universities, governments, you know, all institutions to think, where are people going to be? mentally, emotionally, and economically on the back end of this, and what is it that they want? And people who can provide the services that people want at the price that they can pay for those services will win, and those who ignore the new reality will lose. And that's, I think, just part of the, the natural churn and of events. But yeah, I think to Suchi's point, you know, one would hope that there are, you know, innovators and creative people out there with ideas that have not yet surfaced that will meet the moment and provide people with things that they actually need to be you know, healthy, well, and safe, and not things that they're trying to convince people that they need, which is a, an entirely different thing. So I, you know, I, I think we will see places rise from the ashes. It won't be necessarily the companies that we knew or the places that we knew, but there will be creative and dynamic people out there who are able to again, meet, meet the moment and provide people what they need. And hopefully, you know, getting back to the, the theme of the session, it sort of squares up both with, you know, meeting the, the fears and concerns about, you know, COVID or, or other infectious agents, but also a more sort of climate resilient and more sustainable future. And, and you know, companies that can line those things up in, in the right way are going to be successful in the long term.
Great, thank you. We have a few more minutes left. Um, we got a couple questions in on this topic of um, waste revolving around the COVID-19 situation and how many stores have stopped using shopping bags, personal shopping bags, and, and transferred back to plastic bags, not um, providing things in, as much in bulk anymore, as well as a surge in medical waste and single-use plastic items. Um, how do you see this transitioning back to the progress we had made um, away from single-use plastic? And um, yeah, any thoughts on this? I can tell you this is one of the things that drives me crazy right now. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I appreciate the, the reasons for, for that, that space, but I think it's gonna take us a couple of years to get back to where we are today. Um, you know, I think it's the single use world right now is, is um, moving very, very strongly in, in, the direct, in that direction. Um, so I think it's just going to take us time to get back to what we knew is normal on that front. And hopefully we can do that. Definitely. Anything to add, Dr. Levy? Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, it, I mean, it seems like we've been in this COVID thing for an eternity, right? But it's only been, you know, less than two months, really. And so I think, you know, as we get to more of the medium and long term, the things that actually we tend to do at a university of you know research and study and communicate about things will start to take hold and i'm thinking specifically you know can covid you know live on materials and surfaces for a long time as sort of an active and transmissible virus and you know this is something where there's been some good rapid fire research and some anecdotal information but there just hasn't been simply the time to really understand this so one would hope if over time really the evidence base comes out and you find out, you know, there, there's no way that the virus could live on, you know, a, you know, the bags that you always have in the trunk of your car for, you know, at all, you know, there, you still have to get to the communication hurdle and the fear factor, but then there's the possibility of kind of getting away from the single use. You know, if the evidence shows, you know, the virus can linger in an infectious state for, you know, two weeks on your Whole Foods bag, but you know, five seconds on a plastic bag, we're going to have a big hurdle to address. But I, I think that's where, again, getting to the, the true underlying knowledge and, and of how this virus operates and how you can actually be exposed and, and infected it is going to be key. And, and we're just, you know, scrambling at this point to understand what's going on. Well, I think those are all the questions that we have for today. I really appreciate all the panelists um, giving their insight and having this conversation. Are there any last final points or takeaways that you would just like to add? So I would like to say we need to stay positive. We need to learn something and not feel that the whole world is crashing down. And you know, each one of us is capable of some action of helping others or doing something, you know, and we are all doing research and things like that, understanding what needs to be done and what's the next step. Even something very small, you know, just to stay positive and seeing that we will overcome, you know, it may not be like in the next week or the next month, but we'll definitely overcome because the human spirit always survives and we need to be pretty strong and positive thinking about it. Thank I think you. For, for my closing comment, I feel like Boston University is continuing to move forward in a very strong, positive, directional way. Uh, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this well. Um, it's, you know, it's a bump and we'll get over this bump and we'll move on. Um, I feel like this is a real opportunity for innovation as Sushi has alluded. Um, we're going to see a lot of innovation come out of this. I don't know what it's going to look like, um, but knowing what we know about the importance of sustainability uh, and addressing climate change as a society, I really think there'll be a lot of positive in innovation that comes out in that direction. Definitely, Dr. Levy. Yeah, and, and just, yeah, I mean, I, there's so many threads, and I agree with everything Suchi said about just the need for positivity and a, and a solutions orientation. But and getting back to the broader context of this webinar, right, we're at the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And right, if you look back at where 
things were from an environmental perspective back in 1970 versus now, we've made just outstanding progress on so many dimensions, in part because people sort of put voice to the challenges and then let loose sort of the creativity of, of the human spirit to try to address those challenges. And you know, as we look ahead, obviously there are things like you know, climate change that we have not solved to the same extent that we solved, you know, the Cuyahoga River being on fire and, and things like that. But, you know, one would hope that when we reconvene for the 100th anniversary of Earth Day, we're looking back and say, well, you know, we we put the same sort of work and innovative spirit and regulatory structures in place to address climate change. And we've got that kind of in in the rearview mirror, at least as a problem that we could say we really tackled and solved and you know this again the, the COVID situation gives us you know a huge barrier and challenge in the near term but hopefully we can you know focus on building a more resilient society and tackle our major environmental challenges going forward. Well thank you again panelists so much it was my pleasure talking with everyone today and thank you audience members for tuning in and asking some questions. Um, have a great rest of your BU Earth Day. And now our Sustainability Director, Lisa Tornator, will take it over. That was such a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Um, so thanks to everybody who joined us for the first of two sessions, um, commemorate, commemorating Earth Day with a BU lens. Um, we'd like to give our audience a brief break. So. Hopefully you have um, a few minutes just to stand up, walk around, move your legs a little bit. Um, we will begin our second session at 5.40 p.m. That is titled Caring for Yourself, Others, and Our Planet, a student panel for Earth Day's 50th. So thanks again to Dennis and John and Suchi and of course Natalie as our moderator. John, I really want to thank you again as well for um, following up on the fact that it's the Earth Earth Day is 50th anniversary. It's really important for us. I'm going to share my screen once again so that you all can see what's coming up um, next. So with that, um, happy Earth Day. And we will pause for about 10 minutes. And we'll see you back here at 540 for our next session. So Lisa, I have another meeting to go to. Can I watch the recording or you want me to stay on? We will move you to a participant, I believe. Oh, okay. Thanks, Uchi. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This has been great. Appreciate Natalie, you're, you're moderating the panel. Um, see you in 10 minutes. Yeah, great. Thank you, everybody. Take care.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And a special welcome to those who are joining us anew. We are about to start our second session in our VU Earth Day series, entitled Caring for Yourself, Others, and Our Planet. For those of you just joining us, I am Lisa Tornator, Director of Sustainability at Boston University. As a reminder, we're providing live captioning today which you can enable by clicking on the closed caption or CC button on your Zoom toolbar. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Catherine Mooney. Catherine is the Director of Wellness and Prevention Services. She's the co-chair of the Wellbeing Project at Boston University. She provides vision and leadership to help foster a campus environment that supports students' health and wellness. Thank you so much, Catherine, for being with us. We've also invited five student panelists who will introduce themselves and share their stories with us today. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Lisa. Catherine, it's Lisa. I'm just going to leave this slide up for a little bit while you speak, and then I will stop my screen share, okay? Okay, great. So would you like me to give my introduction now? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you again um, for having me. Hi, everybody. It's great to be joining you. Um, I wanted to sh begin by sharing just a little bit about the Wellbeing Project at Boston University. It's a newer campus-wide initiative to support student health and wellness. It's a collaboration between multiple departments across the university, and our mission is to help students feel their best and think broadly about what contributes to their well-being. Our framework includes physical and emotional well-being, of course, but we're also talking with students about social, spiritual, financial, academic, and environmental well-being. And you know, during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is essential that we think about taking care of ourselves. But it's also really challenging because a lot of our go-to go strategies for well-being, like exercising outside or spending time in green space or gathering for climate activism, um, may be limited or entirely impossible right now. And at the Wellbeing Project, we have heard from students that sharing in this experience does make things a little bit easier. And it's certainly a time when we're leaning on our communities more than ever for connection and support. And that's why I'm so excited about this next panel um, where five students will be talking openly about how they're caring for themselves, others, and our planet um, during this time. So I wanna thank them in advance for sharing their experiences and reflections today because we have a lot to learn from each other and we're certainly in this together. So like the previous panel during today's Q&A, um, the chat box will be open, so we encourage you to submit your questions and we'll be taking them as time allows. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first student panelist, Alyssa, and let her tell us a little bit more about herself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa Helmling. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm from El Paso, Texas, and I study biology at BU. And I think right now how I'm most taking care of myself is by trying to stay active and finding creative outlets. And for me, I think an activity that encompasses both those aspects um, is dancing. So I find that that's a very therapeutic way um, that I've been uh, staying in touch with or staying in tune with my body, but also expressing myself. And then in terms of caring for others, uh, I think mainly by checking in with friends and family and um, loved ones, uh, making sure that they're okay and keeping those connections is really important for both people involved. And as for the planet, um, I think I've mainly been caring for the planet through food and my diet. Um, I've been trying to avoid um, takeout as much as possible, cooking for myself at home, shopping at farmers markets, and I'm also a vegetarian, so I'm trying to reduce my carbon footprint by avoiding meat at all, avoiding all meat, and then I'm also trying to limit other animal byproducts and like things like dairy. And that's how I would say I'm 
caring for myself, others, and the planet. Hi everyone, my name is Savannah Majarowitz. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm uh, from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm currently there right now and I'm a sophomore studying international relations with a minor in Persian studies. And what's really helping me through this whole crisis and pandemic is really being there uh, with my family and with my friends. We often do FaceTime calls or Zoom calls to really just check in on one each other. And I think um, as Alyssa was saying, it really does help be beneficial to support each other. And I find the best thing that helps me is doing any offline activities such as painting or drawing that really helps me get my uh, stress out and any anxieties I've had in a day. And as for the environment, I try to keep up the same techniques I had in Boston with taking really short showers, keeping the lights off when I need to, and just small things like that. Hello, my name is Justin Foliasso. I am a um, junior studying ecology and conservation biology, and I have a minor in earth and environmental science. My pronouns are he, him, his, from Orange County, California. Um, one way that I am getting taking care of myself during this time is well Alyssa and I were actually studying abroad when all this happening and so we actually canceled they actually canceled our program 10 days before we were supposed to leave for the Amazon so I know that that was really hard on everyone in the program uh, feeling like we we're missing out on opportunities and experiences so in order to kind of cope with that I have been reminding myself that these experiences that I'm missing out on whether it's or spending time with friends don't necessarily Necessarily, never have to happen. I can do that once all this kind of clears up and I can always return to Ecuador, return to South America, do all these things um, just at a later point in life. Uh, for like taking care of my or also been trying to pursue hobbies that I don't typically have the time to do, um, such as cooking. So cooking is something I absolutely love doing. So this has given me the time to um, try new recipes, also um, experiment with food, which I know my family really likes as well, um, which kind of leads me into taking care of other people. So as far as cooking for my family, I know that that relieves a lot of stress on their plate. And also um, I've been trying to check in with my friends as much as possible, FaceTiming, um, having Zoom calls, that sort of thing. And as far as taking care of the environment, um, this will be the first time that I'm actually back in California since I left for freshman year. So this is has given me like an ample amount of time to go through some of my old things and kind of find um, new uses for a lot of my old things. I don't really use and they just kind of sit here. So I have that going on. And then also I've been moving things that I don't really want anymore into a donation pile that I'll take in once the situation clears up. And that for a lot of that, that's clothes for some clothes, say that were from high school or have my money, I've been using those and cutting those up and using them in rags. So when we take in groceries, I'll clean um, rags and then also like wipe down door handles, that kind of thing. And also just evaluating what I can do in my own life and looking for alternatives. So having this extra amount of time has given me the opportunity to explore alternatives. Specifically, I wanna focus on reducing my waste in the kitchen and also in the bathroom when it comes to uh, cleaners and like conditioner, shampoo, that kind of thing. So this has given me a lot of time to search for alternatives and kind of establish habits now so that when all this is done and um, my daily routine kind of comes back. I know exactly I already have that habit um, established. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marissa Cardi. I am a sophomore at BU studying psychology uh, with a minor in dance. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm from Hopkinton, Massachusetts, so like 40 minutes outside of Boston. Um, for how I've been taking care of myself, um, I've really been using this as a time to reflect. I journal and I journal about every day. Um, so that's a place for me to kind of write down what I'm feeling, what I've been going through, um, and help be more mindful about what I'm feeling. So if there's a day where I'm feeling particularly great, that's awesome. If there's a day where I'm not feeling so great, I'm anxious, missing friends, um, that's something that I can write down to help me accept and move through that emotion. Um, I've also really been focusing on gratitude. I was also studying abroad this semester and had to return home with 22 hours notice, which was a little bit chaotic. Um, but instead of focusing on all of the things I'm missing out on, um, for me, it was really focusing on the amazing six weeks that I had there. You know, just that alone was such a good experience and such a positive experience that 
I wouldn't want um, the idea of what I'm missing to take away from what I had. Um, so practicing gratitude is definitely important for me taking care of myself. Um, for how I'm taking care of other people, I'm trying to make this situation as fun as possible. So um, I've been FaceTiming and Zooming with friends and family, trying to figure out creative ways that we can have fun with each other, um, playing some games like we played Heads Up with my family, which playing Heads Up over Zoom is interesting, but um, I would recommend you try it out. Um, I'm also working on a newsletter that's going out to senior citizens who are in isolation that gives them cognitive and physical exercises um, and it features a student art page as well so trying to help communities that don't get help otherwise and can't be visited right now that are at high risk um, and for how i'm taking care of the planet um, similar things to what other people have said i'm a vegetarian i try to take short showers and turn off the lights whenever i'm not in the room um, but i think a lot of people around me have been going for drives to try to keep busy because that's something you can do to socially distance but still get out. Um, so I've been trying to not do that. I haven't done it yet. Maybe I'll do it at one point. Um, and also avoiding takeout, plastic containers, anything like that. Hi, everyone. My name is Azanta Takwar. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a senior in the Sargent College studying health science with a minor in environmental analysis and policy in CAS. Um, I grew up in Florida, Daytona Beach, Florida, where I am right now. Um, and uh, it's, very, it's been very sunny and you know, the weather has been really helping me get through this, these challenging times and um, you know, being stuck indoors the whole time. Um, we have a backyard, so it's been nice to just uh, get out and walk around and just be in nature for a little bit. So that's definitely been helping me um, cope. Um, so in terms of taking care of myself, um, I've been trying to be patient with myself. I'm very much a perfectionist and um, I like to be in control. Um, so it's been hard to say the least to um, kind of do all that, but um, you know, not have the ability to see my friends or talk to my professors. And um, I've, you know, I'm working on a lot of projects that I've had to compromise um, a lot of what my goals and vision visions were. So um, just being patient with myself and giving myself the chance to relax and allow myself to be not productive, um, which is definitely a turn from um, the pace I've been going at for the past four years at BU. Um, so it's been, it's been a learning curve for sure. Um, in terms of taking care of others, my, this is the first time I've been home with my family for quite some time. So um, I've been taking this opportunity to take care of my parents and do as much as I can for them. Um, Ramadan, which is the 30 day um, month of fasting for Muslims um, is coming up. So I have taken that on and making dinners and breakfast for my family. Um, so my mom and dad don't have to worry about that. Um, in terms of taking care of the planet, I'm trying my best to keep up the sustainable habits that I built while I was at BU. Um, like everyone else said, taking shorter showers, unplugging stuff. Um, it's hard um, when all I have are electronics are in front of me, but I'm still trying to keep up those habits have been has definitely been something um, that I've been trying to do. Um, also, something that um, I have am experiencing a little bit more now is food waste. Um, we don't have we don't have takeout. We cook every single day, um, so we have a lot of groceries. And um, but I'm just trying to make sure that if we have a couple bananas that um, are about to go to waste, I'm making banana bread out of them or apple something. Um, so just using everything that we have and trying um, to make sure that nothing's going to waste. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing some of those initial reflections and experiences. Um, we're now going to shift in and have a conversation and discussion together. Um, I do have a few questions prepared for the panelists and again want to let our virtual audience know that the Q&A box is open. So if you have questions for these students as well, please submit them and we'll be um, moderating those questions. Um, great. So I wanted to start by asking you all about how you are staying socially connected right now during a time where certainly many of us um, may feel isolated, you know, with, with physical distancing. And, and many of you touched on this already in terms of FaceTime and, and Zoom calls with friends and family, but was wondering if you'd be willing to expand a little bit on some of the creative ways that you've been able to maintain connection during, during this time. 
Um, I can go first, uh, just because I have it in front of me. Um, so I've been getting back into reading a lot more these past few days. Um, and my friends, we FaceTime every night. Um, so recently, my one of my friends, she doesn't like reading at all. So instead, I have started explaining her, to her the book that I'm reading in excruciating detail. So every night we sit and like I explain to her um, like what's happening and like the plot and the dialogue. But recently she's gotten so into it that she's asked me to read chapters. So we have like page flags like this is mine or this is her and this is me. I'm a little farther into the book. Um, so I'm and she, she just told me yesterday that she's gonna she decided she's gonna read the next two books herself. So huge win for me. <laughs> Um, for me, I would say I've been doing like silly personality quizzes with my friends. And so I'll call a friend, both of us will take the same personality test and it's something like, what city are you or what kind of dog are you? Um, but what we've been doing to make it interesting is guessing the other person's answers. So even though the result of the quiz doesn't really matter that much, you can actually learn a lot about your friends that you that may not normally come up in conversation. Um, seeing like what is their preferred night that they would do or what time do they normally wake up in the morning or, um, you know, maybe what is their like ideal career. Um, and so I've been guessing those answers with my friends, which has been a really fun way to learn more about them. Um, um, something that, oh, sorry. <laughs> something that my friends and I uh, have been doing are um, like our like exercise routines. Uh, so some friends do yoga. Um, me and my other friend will do like TikTok dances and like try to challenge each other and like who can do it the best kind of, you know, like dumb things like that that just keep us active. So I've been talking with my friend a lot. Um, when I return to Boston or when we return to Boston, we're gonna be living together and we're gonna get an apartment. So one thing that's really fun for both of us is to FaceTime and then talk about or look at apartments together and then also talk about how you like want to design it and stuff like that. So that's been a lot of fun. We've definitely done that a couple of times. We just did it like earlier today. But yeah. <laughs> for me, I think one fun thing that me and a group of friends did pretty recently was like an art in Zoom, you know, like back in Boston, I feel like um, I'd have groups of friends where we'd get together to someone in someone's dorm or someone's apartment and do art nights where we'd all paint together or go to Trident and go to drawing lessons or things like fun artsy things like that. And in order to kind of keep that like tradition going, we all like Zoom together and some of us were painting, some of us were drawing, some of us were um, knitting. So that was a really fun way to still be doing something together, even if it wasn't physically together. Um, that was a really fun night and I think things like that, finding creative solutions is really important right now and it's kind of really amazing to see what people think of to stay connected. Um, shows how like resilient we are I think as people and creative, you know, yeah. Thanks so much everyone. <clears throat> you know, coming from your examples, so much of your lives right now are spent on screens whether it be Zooming or FaceTiming with friends or certainly classes. And I think a couple of you talked a little bit about offline activities and ways to disconnect um, in order to support your well-being. And so wondering if you have any ideas or tips to share with your fellow Terriers around things you can do to support yourself that, that might not involve a screen. I know something that's become really popular um, and I definitely also partake in is taking daily walks and like leaving kind of screens behind and just going outside, getting some sunlight is really important physically too for like physical health. Um, trying to stay active if you can, if you're able, I think is really important right now. And I think setting times, uh, certain times in the day to like get away from screens and do a physical activity or do art or read or do something that engages your mind in a different way is definitely really important. Um, but I think walking is definitely something I notice more people in my neighborhood doing. Before, if I had taken a walk, I wouldn't have run into anyone going to like a nearby landmark. But now I run into like maybe three different families also going on walks together. So that's something that's really nice to see kind of everyone's going through it together, even if we're distant. I, and also on the internet too, people talking about their daily walks. That's a, kind of a fun activity.
Um, for me, one of the things I've been doing is, I think somebody said it um, earlier, but going through old things. So not only cleaning out my room and getting items to donate, but um, I'm sure everybody has boxes of family photos at their house that are not digitized, that are printed out like the old times. Um, and so I've been going through years and years worth of photos that I've never seen, or at least don't remember having seen because it's been so long. Um, and that's been really fun to see like new pictures of myself and my family as kids. Um, so if you have those old things in your house, that's a very good way to disconnect from screens and also kind of reminisce and reflect. So I know I mentioned this before in my intro, um, but one way I'm kind of getting away from screens is by cooking a lot. And that has been personally really fun for me. I mean, a little bit of a challenge sometimes to make sure that my sister and my mom are also getting what they like. So, but that is just another challenge. And I typically spend a lot of time in the kitchen trying different vegetables and kind of mixing things together and also making side dishes that kind of please everyone. So that's one way that I'm kind of removing myself from screens. Um, I wanted to echo Justin. I'm, I've been doing the same thing, um, you know, spending a lot of time in the kitchen. I've also been on a cleaning, spring cleaning rampage of my house, which my mom um, isn't too happy about, but <laughs> I'm just, or reorganizing everything and um, decluttering and also reading. Yeah, I kind of touched on this a, a bit earlier, but um, I'm just trying to like do more artistic things. So I'll go outside with like a little sketchbook and just either paint or draw some stuff there. And it really just de-stresses me. Thanks everybody. You know, thinking about how <clears throat> this time has disrupted our lives and changed our lives in so many ways, I'm wondering if you might be willing to share some reflection, reflections on what has been the hardest for you, but also what has maybe been a pleasant surprise so far from this experience. Um, so like I mentioned, having to leave Ecuador along with Alyssa was really upsetting for me, um, but I also um, had a summer job planned in Boston that I also lost. So it was really hard for me to cope with the idea of not being in Boston for the summer, something I thought I was going to do um, pretty much all school year. So it was kind of a rough adjustment with the idea of being home for the whole summer because I haven't done that. Um, but it's actually been a pleasant surprise because like I mentioned, um, this is the first time I've been back since I left for Boston in freshman year. So I've kind of seen, oh, well, I finally have the opportunity to spend more time with family. Uh, being in California for the summer isn't something I've experienced for a long time. So it's starting to get warm here now. So I'm really excited for that. And then also just kind of um, getting to know my sister a bit more. She recently moved out. So seeing the ways that she has changed and some of the things she likes to do now has been really interesting. So it's actually turned out to be a really present, pleasant surprise. Yeah, I would agree. Um, just, I think the hardest part is knowing that we, me, Justin and I should both be in the Amazon right now, but like getting past that and knowing that there's nothing we can do really right now to change that. Um, I think taking just a breather in life has been really nice to not be so fast paced. I agree with Azanta that like when I'm in Boston, life feels like it's moving a mile a minute and it's just go, go, go all the time. So finally having time to kind of enjoy hobbies and things I might not always get to do when I'm in a busy rush, you know, doing normal life things uh, is really nice. Taking care of physical health and getting more sleep, I think is really important. Uh, normally during the school year, I might not get as much sleep as I should, um, but now there's more time and more time for exercising, eating clean, cooking good things and sleeping. So all those things have been really great for like physical health and mental health too. So I think that is one uh, benefit to, you know, kind of being home and taking a breather. Um, to piggy off of Alyssa, um, I think for me, the hardest, the most challenging part was um, not being able to say goodbye to a lot of the people on campus, especially because I'm a senior. And um, so that was def definitely difficult to come to terms with. And sometimes, 
I mean, it still is um, to think about, you know, my graduation that was supposed to be happening in um, about three or four weeks won't be happening. So, um, you know, all my stuff is still in Boston too. So um, it's been, it's been hard, but also like Alyssa was saying, it's been nice to kind of just take it slowly and breathe and sleep and, you know, not have to rush from one end of the campus to the other end and back and forth all day long. Um, so it's just like, I forgot what it was like to move slowly. So it's been, it's been nice to take care of myself for a little bit and focus on myself. Uh, for me, um, Boston was really kind of like my escape from like home and where I live really. So it's been kind of a struggle to adapt back to like high school life almost where like I was constantly at home doing work like 24 seven. Um, but I will say that I forgot how much I missed like family dinners. My brother and I have a pretty big age difference. So it's actually really nice to see like him back home and his fiance is here. So it really like makes me feel more connected to my family, even despite uh, not being like where I'd want to be right now. Um, for me, I would definitely say saying goodbye to all of the friends that I made. Um, I was studying abroad in Copenhagen with such short notice um, was really hard for me. And I entered a romantic relationship when I was in Copenhagen. So having to leave him, um, we still talk every day, we're still together. Um, but having to be separated by countries so quickly um, was really, really hard. Um, a pleasant surprise, kind of echoing the same thing, slowing down and enjoying the pace of life again. Um, I noticed once I had started college, it was really hard for me to sit still and just do nothing and just like enjoy a view or a cup of coffee. Um, and the other day it took me two hours to drink my coffee and I just looked out the window and that was like the nicest feeling to have that happen after two years of like almost being worried that I wasn't being productive, um, just sitting still. So that was really nice positive. You all have talked about some of the people in your lives that are making this a little bit easier, whether that be friends or family, um, romantic partners, and wondering if you want to expand a little bit on how the people in your life are contributing to your well-being right now. What are they doing to support you? Um, um, I just wanted to uh, talk about my friends a little bit. Um, I'm writing a thesis currently. It's due in nine days. So it's been one of the hardest things I've done in college. And I, I feel like I'm really, really struggling. Um, but my friends, every single night when we talk, um, they're constantly texting me throughout the day, just message uh, messages of support, of advice, of you know faith in me, um, telling me that I can do this. And even though I might not believe it at some time, at, at some points, they, they believe it enough for me, for the both of us. So um, it's been really, I've been really, really grateful. And um, I've been just realizing how lucky I am to have such great friends. I think um, when I call my friends, it really offers a great, a really great distraction from some of the harder elements of quarantine. Um, especially, I feel like my friends can just make me laugh so easily, and I feel like having these funny moments within maybe a hard day make everything so much better and easier, um, a lot brighter. Um, I, sometimes it's kind of hard to find things to talk about because we're both just at home kind of in the same routine but we try to find new things to tell each other and to talk about which make you look for exciting things in your own day and makes you appreciate you know the differences from day to day so you're looking for things to tell your friends I think which is fun. Um, I think definitely using humor as a distraction has been really, really essential. Um, like you said, little things like, oh, I cooked this new recipe today, or um, I found this old board game in my closet that I used to play with that when I was a kid. Um, it's small things like that that help you get your mind off the pandemic or being able to make a joke about the pandemic. Um, and doing that with friends and family has really helped me. Um, so I think that this is really showing how close everyone is and how like which friends are really 
there for you all the time. And I think kind of going back to taking it slow and enjoying life. One thing I really like doing is just talking with my friends, like I said, on FaceTime or Zoom or something and not feeling like I'm rushed to go to a meeting or a class, just talking for two, three hours at a time has really helped me. And it really shows through those conversations um, how close we all are and how much we all rely on each other. So that's been really nice in helping me getting through this um, time. Um, Marissa kind of mentioned this, but like with board games and like card games, especially um, my brother is really good into roping everyone to like sit down and play together after dinner, which really kind of like gives everyone like a relief of stress and it's something the whole family is doing and it's just a fun activity altogether. Thanks everyone. I have a couple of questions that are a little more focused on our relationship to the planet that I want to um, toss your way. And the first is just how you feel like your relationship to the environment or issues of sustainability have changed during this past month. Um, I think this was talked a little bit about in, or well, a lot about in the last panel, but um, I think it um, it will be harder to get away from single-use plastics now because you know grocery stores um, are a lot of people are using that because the coronavirus lasts um, for less time on plastic bags and things like that. And me, as someone who's always used a reusable bag for things like that, like groceries, that's a hard like thing to break. And some some grocery stores do still let you use reusable bags, but you have to be a lot more careful now. And I think the progress, it was talked about in the, in the last panel, but the progress we made for those kinds of strides are, you know, it's one step back. But I think um, my relationship with the environment is, I think it's a harder for all of us to reconnect with nature right now, but we have to remember that, or at least for me, it's very therapeutic and healing. Uh, reconnecting with nature, so still making time to go in your backyard if you have one, to take walks if you can through the outdoors, through nature, trying to appreciate the natural beauty there is, or even uh, bringing house plants into your living space to make it a little bit greener. Things like that can be really helpful and healing. Um, green space, I think, is really important for us as human beings, so finding that wherever you can is important, even if it is a bit harder right now. Uh, I think for me, it's been a little bit more philosophical almost. Um, you know, you can't go out on the weekends and go on long drives. You can't shop for fun and leisure. Um, and for me, that's really showed me how I don't value those things in my life and how I don't miss them and they don't add to my life. Um, you know, one of the things I used to do with like my mom or and my aunts was go and like walk around a TJ Maxx for a few hours. And that was how we socialized. Um, and it's really helped me see how much consumer culture is ingrained in our social lives, even for like things that we don't need or want. We just find them out in a store because we're in a store. Um, and so for me, it's really, really changed my perspective on how much we do those things mindlessly and how much we don't need to do those things. Um, so, I'm sorry, I just blanked. <laughs> um, so I think, so for me, going up to Boston was a huge change in like the sustainability, um, like atmosphere, if that makes any sense. Um, like living in Boston, I actively and consciously thought about sustainability every single day um, because I had my own apartment. I worked at sustainability. Um, Boston used reusable bags. Um, like it was just something that I consciously thought about public transportation. Um, in Florida, the culture is very, very different. Um, so it's not something that people really acknowledge or think about. Um, it's not a conscious decision um, because it's not really something that's incorporated into culture. Um, I haven't left the house in like 37 days, um, but so I, I don't, I haven't gone grocery shopping. Um, so I haven't been like, you know, sucked into back into using single use plastics and like kind of being careless about it. 
Um, but it has been more difficult to like actively and consciously think about sustainability when I'm not out and about all the time and I'm not in Boston. Um, so it's just a matter of like, you know, reminding myself, um, especially when I sit down to work or, um, you know, sitting in front of a window like I am right now, just reminding myself um, that it's a part of my life and it will be again when, when we, when everything was back to normal. Um, so as far as going on walks and stuff like that, um, I, I mean, I lived here for 18 years and I walked a lot of the same streets and played at the same, a lot of the same parks around here when I was growing up. So now revisiting these same spots multiple times, because I have my typical loop that I go on a walk, um, has made me re or gain more appreciation for some of the life that's just right by my house that I never really felt super connected to growing up. So that's been really nice. Um, and also how this has kind of changed on like the note of how it's changing other people's perspectives um, on sustainability. I'm really interested to see that because now if you need to go to the grocery store, it's you go when you really need to and you need to get what you need. And I'm really interested to see how that's going to change people's attitudes and behaviors once this is over, if people are going to continue going only when they really need to um, and only like and buy things for like an extended period of time because I know at least here in Southern California, it's all one big suburb. So there really isn't public transportation. Um, there really isn't a culture of walking places like you do in a city. So you pretty much drive to a grocery store even if it's a five minute walk away. And so I'm really interested to see if people will make that short drive even less now that we've kind of adapted this new habit of only going when you absolutely need to. I think overall for me, it just taught me to appreciate nature more and really that walking culture that exists in Boston. Um, as Azanta like, iterated uh, in Florida, we don't really have public transportation. Um, everyone uses the car. You really need a car to get around here. Um, I personally have not like driven since um, quarantine has started. And so really um, what I miss the most about Boston is really the walks to class and everything. So doing walks in my neighborhood really is the best thing I can to mimic that. And now I realize I really appreciated it uh, when I had it. So just keeping that in mind is helping. You all have had some great insights around how this experience has changed your perspective, you know, behaviors, attitudes of others as well. And I, I wonder what you think about this sort of bigger question, which is what this experience of, of going through this pandemic and, and you know, spending a lot of time at home or, or in an isolated way, what does this mean for your generation specifically in terms of the sustainability movement? Um, I think this kind of shows how no matter what we are going to face, we will be able to get through it. Um, I'm sure three months ago, none of us ever could have imagined being sent back home from respective states, countries, cities, um, having so many people be unemployed, not being able to go outside um, except for a walk or groceries, um, and knowing that climate change and bigger global issues like this are coming in the future. Um, it's really reassuring to see that even under drastic, drastic lifestyle changes, um, we can still get through and connect through it. I think um, one thing that has really like been eye-opening and I think for a lot of people as well, um, it's been in the news and on social media, it's kind of gone viral how certain ecosystems around the world are like recovering because of the decline in human activity. And I think that is a really hopeful sign that um, we can still um, help the, the environment recover from the damage we have inflicted on certain ecosystems. Um, and I know there's like a lot of like sentiment that we are the virus like human beings were the virus to earth but I don't think that's accurate or like a good narrative to have because it kind of frames this picture that like it's us versus nature when it shouldn't be that way we should be like cohabitating with nature and working with creative solutions to live in a world where it doesn't have to be that we we destroy nature in order to survive like 
I think this has really um, opened eyes for a lot of people. And I think especially young people are becoming really passionate about climate change activism, a lot of different environmental uh, issues. And I think this is gonna really inspire people to come up with creative problem solving because clearly even now um, people are still existing in this world and environments are recovering. We just have to find a way to keep that going while continuing our, our daily life and find a way to kind of find balance, I guess, is the way I would describe it. On that same note, I think it's really interesting, or I'm really interested to see how, not only how every aspect of life is going to change um, in the future, but also how this new idea about rebuilding the economy um, during this time, how that's going to incorporate sustainability in some aspects, because I think that this situation has really revealed that we're all very vulnerable. And in some cases, I, I think it might highlight some of the issues that we have in our current systems, especially with the economy. So I'm really interested to see how the sustainability movement pushes more on rebuilding the economy in a sustainable way and changing the conversation from kind of fixing um, what we already had and like invest or fixing things for the sake of fixing them for um, being good um, to actually like rebuilding to prepare for things like this in the future and also just redevelop how we do business and how we interact with other people and treat our employees and our employers um, in a different in a different, more sustainable, equitable workplace. I think it just shows how resilient our generation is. I mean, we've been through a lot in our lives with various issues, but I think what this crisis has shown us is that our generation is starting to pay attention more and more um, as things like this happen. And I really hope hope that translates into more policy surrounding uh, sustainability and, you know, creating more energy around the activism that goes on. Um, I want to reiterate everything everyone said. I think everyone made such great points. And also that um, the situation has shown to the world how quickly it's possible to make change. Um, our lives changed within a matter of a week. Um, so those who were resistant to change were only resistant for um, you know, we're, we're not resistant because of outside reasons or more so for selfish, for selfish reasons. So I think, I hope that the lesson that we take away from this is that we can hold people accountable and that change is really possible, like so quickly, um, that we can make change. So I hope that we all. Thanks, everybody. You know, with the few minutes that we have left, I think I want to just pose one more question and sort of bring it back to BU in a way, you know, soon enough, and hopefully that will be sooner rather than later, we will all, um, or most of us will be back together on campus. Um, and I'm wondering how this experience has um, changed the way you might take care of yourself into the future. You know, many of you have commented on how you are maybe getting more sleep or better sleep. Um, that sort of the pace of, of life has really changed and in, in some ways for the better, um, or that you've redefined what productivity means or success. Um, and I think these are really insightful outcomes um, for this challenging time. And I'm just wondering how you're going to sort of take this information and lessons that you've had forward in order to support yourself and others in terms of your well-being in the future. Um, this is something that I've discussed with quite a few people, and I know this is a big topic of conversation too, but I think it reveals a lot about disability access, um, that we haven't um, been paying much attention or giving a lot of effort towards making things available online, um, but moving forward in my own life, I will do like everything as much as I can to make things available online and record things and, you know, add captions and things like that. So I think that's something that I'm definitely going to learn from this and take, take, take away from this. Um, personally, I think that this experience of kind of switching back to a slower pace of life was in a way really restorative for me. Um, I think I learned that I needed that break. Um, the first two weeks, especially, I felt more energized and just overall healthier, um, like mentally um, too. 
So I think that I'm going to take that lesson back with me to Boston and really remind myself that if I need to take a break, it's okay to take a break and taking the time to go on a walk or do a hobby or activity that I really enjoy is definitely worth it because I've definitely seen through these, through this experience so far that that is definitely, I have definitely underrated that um, for myself in the past. I think after this and going back to Boston and BU, I'm going to really appreciate um, social time with friends. Just be having, not having that uh, physical closeness uh, is going to make me really appreciate those times, you know, even just sharing a meal together, going to the dining hall together, little things. You're, I feel like we're all going to appreciate that a lot more after having been through this experience. And definitely I agree with Justin. I think uh, making mental health and physical health a priority um, more so than I did before is going to be a huge um, thing I'm going to take away from this. Again, sleep is so, so important. And I feel like as college students, a lot of the time we put that on the back burner in, you know, in favor of assignments and studies, which are definitely important too, but we have to take care of ourselves and appreciate each other. So I think those are the two lessons that I'm uh, taking away the most from this experience for Boston. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, when I go back, I really want to participate in more events and go explore Boston more. I always said like, oh, I'll go do this later and would just put it off. I kind of want to make sure, you know, I am getting those experiences in and making memories with friends. And I also agree with both Justin and Alyssa in making sure that my mental and physical health are prioritized because we're busy students, we're always stressed doing work and really making sure that we have the time to relax and, you know, give ourselves that break is extremely important. Um, for me, it's also definitely given me perspective. Um, this is the first time I've been outside of an extremely competitive academic environment between high school and then going straight from high school to BU. Um, and for me, it's been a little bit different because I was enrolled in University of Copenhagen courses, so I wasn't even taking BU courses when I was abroad. Um, and my courses were much, much more relaxed than my courses at BU are. Um, and so going from such a competitive academic environment all the time for years on end to then being in an academic environment where academics aren't your entire life to then being home and still in that academic environment. Um, it's like somebody hit the reset button and you see there is so much more to your life than your academics. Um, and I'm sure it's like similar for people that are working at the moment, you know, you can wake up in the morning and go to sleep thinking the entire day about whatever your work life is, whether it's being a student or a job. Um, and even on weekends and on vacations, you're still thinking about it. Um, so I think this has definitely changed not only my perspective on returning to BU, um, but for the rest of my life that there is space outside of your daily activities that is your life that you need to own. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your for sharing your experiences, your insights, your perspective. This has been a wonderful conversation to hear about how you are managing through this time and thinking about your relationships to your own well-being, to others, and, and of course, to our planet. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Lisa, who's going to wrap us up and, and share a few resources on our way out. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you everyone. Thanks to all the participants. I really appreciate your thoughtful conversations um, and sharing those personal stories with us. Uh, special thanks to our panelists in session one, as well as those who put in so much time and effort in planning this online event in lieu of our typical Earth Day Festival. Uh, firstly, Azanta Takur, who's one of our panelists here. Uh, she's an event planning intern. Uh, also, Erica Madison, our Assistant Director for Sustainability Communications, as well as our communications interns. And last but not least, Gabriela Bocio Santos, our engagement manager who led the visioning for this excellent uh, program today. Thank you to you, our participants, for joining us. 
um, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And, and thank you to all of our campus partners and, and those who supported us, um, both in this online setting, as well as um, those who were helping us plan our Earth Day festival, our traditional in-person festival. We look forward to working with all of you again in the fall, fingers crossed. And finally, we want you, we want to ask you all to do something tangible today. For this Earth Day, please join us on the Sustainability at BU app. You can download this on any smartphone. Um, we have a challenge for Earth Day habits. Uh, you can also join BU Libraries this Thursday at 3 p.m. for their Earth Day themed edit-a-thon and the global Earth Day events that are happening all day tomorrow, which you can find on earthday.org. With that, this session will be, um, is definitely recorded and so will be hosted on our website when that becomes available later this week. So I wanna thank everyone once again for participating and have a lovely Earth Week.